Hello, 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 and welcome once again to Movies That Pop. I'm the Colonel, and welcome to today's special episode. Woo! We did it, guys! 2016 is over, and we all survived it. Now, there were a lot of people complaining that this was a terrible year for movies, coming, as it did, on the heels of the far superior 2015 crop of films. But I believe that this mindset was caused by two things. How many celebrity deaths we had to endure this year, and how many high-profile and often mega-budgeted critical and financial disappointments were released into theaters. Some of these movies, like Ghostbusters, The BFG, and Alice Through the Looking Glass, I enjoyed a lot more than most. Ghostbusters, look, Ghostbusters is looked at as a bomb now, but I think that a sequel would have been better once the filmmakers cast off the shackles of the Ghostbusters legacy and forged their own path forward. Thanks to the movie's failure to meet the massive box office expectations, I guess we'll never know. And it's the same deal with my number four pick, which we'll get to. I'd have loved to see a sequel or two to that one, but the audience just wasn't there, which is a shame. Now this was a trend in 2016. Ill-founded or simply too expensive attempts to create or reignite money-making machines. What's up, DC Comics? I'm looking at you, baby. I'm also looking at you, Jason Bourne and Independence Day, and so on and so forth. On the positive side, this was an insanely good year for animated films. Although only one animated film made my list this year, Trolls, Finding Dory, Zootopia, and Kung Fu Panda 3, which came out in January, all provided bright spots on the cinematic roster this year. Heck, even Storks was better than I expected it to be. Also, a quick note while we're talking about trends this year, what's up with the trend of having directors directing two movies this year? I mean, we've all seen Steven Spielberg do this a couple of times in his career, but this year, there were quite a few fellas making us all look lazy by producing two major cinematic works within months of each other. Jeff Nichols with Midnight Special and Loving, David Yates with The Legend of Tarzan and Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, and Peter Berg with Deepwater Horizon and Patriot's Day. Suck on that, Alejandro Gonzalez Inaritu. Better pick up the pace, amigo. So with all complaining about disappointments aside, there were more than enough bright spots this year to make compiling this year's list as difficult as ever. A lot of them, as always, snuck in during the last month or so, and in the traditional Christmas to New Year's traffic jam, I didn't get a chance to review everything I wanted to see, but I'll get to most of the major releases eventually, and I believe I now have enough information to make this year's list with confidence. That being said, I feel the need to express the caveat that this list is, of course, like every other list, highly subjective, and thus imperfect, blah, blah, blah. All right, let's get started. Now, there are a couple of films mentioned here that are films I saw well after their release window and therefore never made an actual review for, but for everything else, you will find links to my original reviews in the show notes below. So first, let's give a shout out to some honorable mentions that were really good movies that came out this year, but just barely missed a spot on the list. Moonlight, take a bow. Captain America Civil War, I salute you. Ooh, Deepwater Horizon, so close. Here's looking at you, Jungle Book. Rogue One, the force was strong with you. Deadpool, way to give him hell. And Edge of 17, Psst. we can do it in the Petland stock room anytime you want. All right, now that we've warmed up, let's kick off the top 10 best films of 2016 list with number 10, which fittingly is 10 Cloverfield Lane. This small claustrophobic thriller came out of nowhere early this year to give us all the heebie-jeebies with its ground level story of monsters and men, which boasted an Academy Award worthy supporting performance by John Goodman. Number nine was Hacksaw Ridge, a stirring war film from Mel Gibson that chronicled a real life hero, a man who wants to serve in war, but refuses to kill. Hacksaw Ridge romanticized heroism in its war scenes without romanticizing violence and definitely understood the difference between the two. Number eight was Fences, a film based on a Pulitzer Prize winning play by August Wilson, directed by Denzel Washington, and featuring a pair of stunning performances by Denzel and Viola Davis that had me fascinated throughout its long running time. In Troy Maxson, Denzel brings to life a classic cinematic character whose personality is larger than life and whose demons and personal inadequacies grow before your eyes to become larger than life themselves. A story of a Pittsburgh family that spans years but never leaves its one location for very long, Fences does feel like a stunning, immersive night of theater and carries you along with its dialogue like music being performed by an extremely talented orchestra that makes the most of each note. If he hadn't already won two of them before, you'd be hearing a lot of Oscar talk surrounding Denzel on this one. As it is, a captivating performance by Denzel Washington has sort of become a given at this point, as he's generally regarded by most people as one of the world's finest actors, and the Oscar buzz this year has been swirling around another performance instead. That'd be Casey Affleck in my number seven pick, Manchester by the Sea, another 
independent film with a smaller, low-budgeted story that really creates a handful of unique and relatable characters and transports you to a very specific time and place. Manchester by the Sea produced one of the biggest gasps of the year from me, and it still haunts me to this day. Continuing the trend of smaller, lower-budgeted films at number six is Jeff Nichols' Midnight Special. Like the previous two films I mentioned, it gives you only small bits of the story, just enough so that you can fill in the blanks on your own and just infer the rest. Unlike those previous two films, though, the scale of this story is much, much bigger, and the blanks to be filled in by your imagination are huge. This one came out way early in the year, but it stayed with me all the way through because of its heart-wrenching story of loss and faith and pure parental love. Now we're gonna get to another one of those a little bit higher up on this list, and that one was a little bit more intellectually challenging, but Midnight Special really, really hits the sweet spot. At number five is a movie that I didn't catch until well into its limited release, so I didn't make a review for it back then. So please, allow me just a moment to slobber all over hell or high water. Chris Pine and Ben Foster play brothers who rob banks to save their family farm, and Jeff Bridges plays a close-to-retirement Texas Ranger trying to catch them in this gripping tale that feels very much of our time and goes to places that you wouldn't expect. Ben Foster deserves some recognition, which to date he hasn't been getting, for his performance as the black sheep of the two robbers. The story builds and gradually shifts your loyalties and rooting interests until you have the benefits of full perspective by the time this caper comes to its end, which is... I mean, there were some great endings to movies higher up on this list, so I hesitate to call this the best final scene of 2016, but the last scene of Hell or High Water is beautifully executed, well acted and shot, and it's it's just graceful, that's the word. It's the perfect, graceful ending to a gripping film, and one you should definitely seek out if you haven't already. Number four. Here we get away from the indie movie trend on this list and up to a movie that cost too much to make and ultimately didn't prove profitable. And like I said before, it's one I would have loved to have seen a sequel to and that's The Nice Guys. It's a period film, it's a buddy comedy, it creates some indelible characters, it takes risks, it's got a groovy, bouncy quality to the dialogue and the storytelling techniques and it's probably the most rewatchable of any film on this list. I've personally shown it to several people on Blu-ray this year, and it kills every time. Everyone who hated all of the franchise-building failures this year, well, this is the franchise that should have been born in 2016. And that, my friends, is the year's biggest bummer. Number three is the best animated film of 2016, Kubo and the Two Strings, which told a story with huge amounts of heart and depth and abounded with surprises at every turn, not the least of which was the way the story was resolved. But it was also the most visually dazzling film of the year, and the one that benefited the most from being presented in eye-popping 3D. It's also the best movie Leica has made, as they edge ever closer to being the next Pixar. All right now, here we are, top two. I sort of went back and forth on the top two films. Now, I saw both of these films twice. I love them both for different reasons, and I personally think that both are flawless films at doing what they do. But having a tie for first place is such a weenie move, and I, I just had to pick one movie to rule them all, you know? So first runner-up is La La Land at number two. This movie swept me away from its opening frame, and I fell in love with Emma Stone, Ryan Gosling, this movie, and Hollywood in general. Frequently thrilling, visually appealing, and very, very emotional. This one, too, has an unexpected but perfectly executed and graceful ending. Also, not for nothing, I often find myself walking around with sections from the score or original songs from the soundtrack stuck in my head. I'm gonna tell you, it's not an unwelcome sensation. <laughs> And now we've arrived at my choice by a nose, I should remind you, for the best film of 2016, and that's Arrival. This one creates a unique mood, a sense of wonder, and of horror, and of awe, as a workout for the mind and for the emotions, Arrival packs a wallop. It hit me just as deeply the second time I saw it, when I could see the delicately woven tapestry of the narrative plainly for what it was from start to finish, and what I saw was beautiful in its execution. Arrival is a triumph of editing, cinematography, and imagination with a masterful performance by Amy Adams at its core. Another example of a film with a perfectly executed, enlightening, and graceful ending, Arrival is the perfect ending to this list as well. And that's going to end this look back at 2016. As always, you can follow me, the Colonel, on Twitter, at Movies That Pop, and please click the icon right down there to visit our channel. You'll find reviews of most of these films and so much more. And you can support us by clicking subscribe while you're there. Please. 
Leave me your own personal list of the top 10 films of 2016 in the comments as well. And what films are you most looking forward to in 2017? Let me know, and I'll try to make sure I review it when it comes out. As you can tell by this list, I don't always get to the great ones in a timely fashion, but I usually come around eventually. In the meantime, thanks for watching. I'm the Colonel, and I'll see you next year. We did it, guys.